Let's get started. Uh, okay. Um, so yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm still recording this. So I don't have anybody on, but um, but yeah. I'll, post announcement about uh, if I do have to do some of these sessions where they're completely face-to-face uh, -face here. So um, I, was, I was planning on um, talking some more about the, uh, the banker's algorithm, the deadlock avoidance here, maybe. So um, just for the third problem set that you guys should be working on. Um, see if anybody has more questions about that. I, I got a few questions um, about that, which is good. So people were watching the previous session. Um, and uh, maybe we'll also talk a little bit about the chapter five semaphores and things. Um, I kind of wanted to go over. There, there were a lot of lecture videos um, for this unit and uh, for, for, for chapter five and chapter six. So hopefully everybody's watching those. Uh, so I do talk about all this stuff for the um, um, handling deadlocks in chapter six um, on the uh, you know the, the unit uh, uh, the chapter six material and your content. So I'll cover it again here. I thought um, there's quite a few videos about uh, the concurrency mechanisms, um, semaphores, and things from chapter five. So, but yeah, I thought I might go over the um, uh, P threads example. Um, um, again as well. So, um, so before I jump into it, maybe I'll just kind of um, um, say a few things about. Uh, so, see, so yeah, I'm going to talk about Chapter Six material first here because I want to talk about the uh, the banker's algorithm um, question for the problem set again. Um, but um, Chapter Six is mostly about um, dealing with deadlocks in an operating system. So whenever you have concurrency, uh, deadlocks could be an issue and you potentially have to do something about them. So uh, the first part of chapter six, you know, talks about the principles of deadlocks, which I won't go into here, but kind of the, the big conclusion on this section was in order for deadlocks to occur in a system, I mean, there has to be four things have to exist. So there's three necessary conditions. Um, you know, systems have to, to enforce mutual exclusion. Systems have to um, um, not allow preemption. So once you um, are allocated a resource or have a lock on a resource, you can't be forced to give it up. That's what we mean by no preemption. Um, and systems have to allow hold and wait, uh, which means that you can lock a resource and use it for a bit, uh, but then later on request another resource. So, so you can, you can, um, uh, lock a resource and wait till another resource uh, becomes available. So th those are the three necessary conditions. If, if you have those, then deadlocks are, can potentially occur in the system. Um, these aren't um, sufficient for a deadlock to occur. So for a, a, an actual deadlock to occur, you have to have a particular um, sequence of requests uh, for resources, right? So the um, the, the most straightforward way of a deadlock, right, is, um, you know, I have process one, uh, request A, and then request B, and then process two, request B, and then request A. You get a deadlock because A, and get, or process one, and get A, and, and then get interrupted to go over to the process. Two and then cross two to get a lock on B, and then at that point, we're in the process one has A, and it's going to be waiting the next time the process will be waiting on B. So B is already blocked by process two. Um, and then um, vice versa, so process two uh, is going to block B and wait for all this waiting. Um, you guys ought to know how to do the um, um, these kinds of resource allocation graphs. Uh, 
because um, yeah, I used these. I didn't use these on the problem set, but uh, you probably get a question to, to like create one of these um, on test, for example. So, so the simplest kind of deadlock is, is something like um, process one, these circles for um, processes. Uh, currently, it's allocating A. Uh, and then process one is requesting B. So when you have a cycle in a resource allocation graph like that, that's an indication there's a potent, that, that there's a deadlock, right? So um, it can be the case that there's not actually a deadlock, you know, you've got a cycle in a direct resource allocation graph like this. The only way that that can occur is uh, I think our textbook uses dots uh, if there's multiple. In that case, even though there's a cycle, it's not actually a deadlock because we still have a free one. So, so this request for the could be shot. All right, that makes Example of that so I um, mentioned that before I get into the banker's algorithm here because uh, the first kind of thing you can do to handle a deadlock is to just completely prevent that in the first case. Um, so to prevent a deadlock, what you have to do is you have to remove one of these necessary or sufficient conditions. Right? You have to do something about one of these four things here. Um, you can't really do anything about mutual exclusion. So that's um, what we talk about in uh, chapter five. And we've been talking about this since the second problem set. Uh, because um, if you don't enforce mutual exclusion, you have race conditions or other problems of concurrency, right? So like in that threading example that we used for the previous problem set, problem set two, if multiple programs uh, or multiple threads can access a shared memory variable, uh, and you don't protect that. If you don't enforce mutual exclusion for a shared resource, um, you'll end up having incorrect, um, um, you know, the, so, you, so you'll, you'll the, 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 the program won't execute correctly. You won't get the results you're expecting, basically, because of that interference or the, that race conditions that happen, right? So in, in general, uh, of these four, you, you really can't usually get rid of mutual exclusion, that necessary condition. So it, it, you want to support, the only way you can get rid of mutual exclusion is to not have concurrency. So to only have one thing running, at a, ever running at a time. Right? Um, um, so, so normally we can't do that one, but, but we can, for example, get rid of like the circular, circular weight, right? So an obvious way to do that is to, uh, to enforce some sort of an order. Right? So things that implement deadlock prevention that want to address the, uh, the, the sufficient condition of circular weight, they often define a order. You know, like if you have to first allocate A, and then second allocate B. You know, so for all the resources, you have to define the order. And then if anything needs multiple of these, um, um, they have, to, they have to allocate them in the defined group. So that's the reason why that works, except the particular way. You know, so you can see that the problem here is that um, since we can do them in different order, it's possible for, for B1 to allocate A, get a lock on that, and then P2 to get a lock on B. And so we've got the particular way. Uh, but if we have an order, that, that breaks uh, condition four. So it, it makes it so that. Um, you can never have this kind of situation. So if we do this, we do P1 out to A. Um, uh, and then it gets interrupted. P2 is not going to be out. You know, P2 first also has to allocate A before it can be on and allocate anything else. It's going to be, be um, blocked at that point without allocating A. So eventually, then P1 will run again. And also get its lock on B, do its work, uh, and then we'll just continue to make run. 
what the Italian mechanism for that back to that prevention. That's the right? so, so most of the problem with the other Denmark prevention is that it um, makes the, the, the system less efficient. Um, and you know, it talks, we talk about that in um, it, our tech book talks about that. And I talk about that. This one doesn't, doesn't affect efficiency too much. The only overhead is that we have something that enforces the order. I'm ordered that you have to have the allocate then you have something to check that nobody tries to allocate something on the borders. So that, that ends up being the overhead that's necessary to do something somewhere that you can check in the process. Do the first allocate fee and then try to make a request to somebody. Um, so, um, oh, by the way, so, so so these are so if you don't know what we mean by hold weight, um, so you can prevent hold weight by doing something like um, um, same from this example. So we could say that um, you have to request all of your resources. Like a single request, and you have to do that at the very first before you can do anything else. Right? So, in that case, you can't allocate A um, and then get interrupted. You can allocate none. So, so, to address the whole plate, you have kind of a modification of the locking mechanism where you have to lock everything you need, um, basically, kind of comical at the same time. Again, to do that, either I will get both A and B and then I can use them, or um, if all the resources are available right now, then I will not get any of them. Wait there until both A and B are available. So that's an example of holding weight or uh, preventing deadlock by enforcing no holding weight. So if you're doing that, you're not allowing you to get the whole A uh, and then potentially what be fully locking the whole line way for the whole way. Um, and you know, preemption, you can also allow preemption um, instead as a way to um, let that box know. The way that works, so that, that works by like a rollback mechanism. So, um, so we might do the same thing. So, so um, if you want to tag, it's interrupted with uh, B. Um, but um, at this point, then potentially deadlocked, but it, it, um, um, we come back with P1 request B. Um, and uh, Go back to the two and I say, we see a deadlock. Um, if we can allow for preemption, um, we might, for example, say P2 go back when you did. And maybe once P2 had B, uh, it did some work with B, right? So, so, so it looks common in like databases. So you have to create what's known as a, um, um, what do you call it, transaction or something like that. The transaction can be rolled back. You know, any work back to the transaction and you can undo it. It's basically done for the same reason for this kind of deadlock um, um, issue. So if, if you did some work with B, uh, and then it comes to A in mind that you can't get it from the system deadlock. We might say, that's what P2. You know, um, um, Preempt P2. So it will release your lock on B. So we get rid of that lock. But you know, to release my lock on B, the problem is that I might have done some work with B. In order to, in order to, to complete all my work, you might have to do some work with B and A as well. So that means that you have to undo what I did and then free up my lock. And then you just roll back and go back to the 
and now we're not going to pull back. If it's working, and it keeps working, we'll be Um, anyway, so that's, you know, that's, that's the essence of, of deadlock prevention, right? So uh, the, the, the two that I was just talking about, right, um, you know, getting rid of um, folding weight or allowing for preemption here, uh, those have inefficiencies, right? So, um, for example, uh, like getting rid of the holding weight condition, um, as, as a necessary condition. So, so if you have to allocate all your resources up front uh, before you proceed to use them, um, and that means that they all have to be available before I can lock them. Right? So, so if you allow the weight, um, I can allocate one resource and do something with it for a while. And, uh, then, before I count the other resources and use them to do so. So, um, for removal of weight, though, um, I potentially have to wait um, some time. Right? And, and I can be waiting a long time for all the resources I need available. Right? So, that, that makes that reduces the efficiency of concurrency, which is the main reason why we want concurrency in an operating system or any system is to increase efficiency, to allow utilization of resources uh, to, and maximize that. Um, um, I mean, but anyway, yeah, I mean, you know, so there, there's, there's three ways to deal with deadlocks, um, and this is one, I mean, just prevent them all together, right? So the advantage of that is that, yeah, you prevent, you can prevent deadlocks if you can deal with one of those four necessary and sufficient conditions. But um, 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 so that's ideal, but um, it has performance implications. So of these three methods, this one's going to reduce the performance, the effectiveness of concurrency the most. They'll have the greatest um, reduction of performance based. So that's why you, we might prefer to use something else like um, uh, an avoidance or a deadlock detection. So, um, uh, maybe I'll jump to deadlock detection real quickly because I'm probably not going to talk about that much today. I mean, deadlock detection and prevention have some similarities, but they are different mechanisms. Um, I'm sorry, detection and avoidance. So for detection, basically what you do is you say, you kind of give up. You say, okay, I'm, I'm not going to do anything about to prevent uh, deadlocks. I'll just let them happen. Um, so that that allows concurrency to be as efficient as possible, but with the risk that deadlocks can occur, right? So, the, the, so for deadlock detection, um, uh, we, we potentially allow deadlocks to occur and we just might run um, uh, this procedure periodically to say, well, is there any deadlock in the system? So if I can detect that there's a deadlock in the, in the system, um, then you know, I might do something about it by, uh, so the normal thing is I might just uh, pick one of the processes that's in deadlock and just uh, terminate, right? So in that case, um, you know, that's kind of an extreme thing to do, but, um, but, but if a deadlock has occurred, all the processes that are in deadlock are not gonna be able to finish their work. So, um, so, so by this kind of, this third mechanism, I, I just allowed deadlocks to occur. Um, and if I detect one, maybe I try and stop one of the processes in order to get rid of the deadlock, which at least some of the processes then can finish their work. Um, at the the um, the loss though is that the, the process that was deadlocked might have done some work with the resources that it had allocated. So if I if I terminate it, um, that work I mean might not be just lost because I if because I might not be able to roll that work back. Like we were just talking about for the whole weight condition, so I might that that process might be in kind of a bad state, or, or leave the system in a bad state if I terminate it um, like that to um, by this deadlock detection mechanism. So um, deadlock avoidance, then um, we'll talk about that. That's that's what you're doing for the uh, the, the last question, the second question on the current problem set here. Um, 
is kind of in between, right? So you basically set up mechanisms that will keep deadlocks from occurring. Um, um, like that, uh, sorry, uh, avoidance. So, so for deadlock avoidance, uh, you set up mechanisms that, that will keep um, deadlocks from occurring, um, but you need quite a bit of, you need to add some extra things to the system to do this. And so it, it introduces a lot of overhead. Um, it, it reduces performance in that way, right? But, it, 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 but if, if you implement these, um, it can, um, to uh, avoid a deadlock from ever occurring in the first place, you know, so like like prevention, um, avoidance mechanism in there, um, you won't get deadlocks. So. Um, there's really actually two flavors of deadlock avoidance, at least that our textbook talks about. So, for one, um, you can when a new process starts up. You can look at the resources that that new process says it's going to need uh, and then make a decision whether it would be safe or not to um, allow that new process to start. Okay? So that's, that's called process initiation denial by our textbook, um, and that's just making one um, safe or not safe decision um, just when the process you know, first starts up. Right. So it's safe or not to admit it to the system. Right? It kind of work. It ends up working in a similar way to the banker's algorithm, the the, the resource allocation denial. Um, but um, uh, but again, this is going to be a little bit less efficient than resource allocation denial because um, you know the, the whole process might be blocked, even though um, potentially um, it, the, we could start the process up and it could do a little bit of work. Um, 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 we made the decision on a request by request basis. Um, sorry, I, um, I won't talk anymore about the process of initiation analysis. So the um, the problem on our problem set was to use resource allocation denial. So um, for that. Um, um, we make a decision every time a new resource or a new set of resources is requested uh, by the processes that are running in the system, right? And um, we have to make a determination whether it would be safe to grant that uh, request for additional resources or not, right? And the reason why this works is because we, we can detect um, um, an unsafe uh, request because by, by examining the state of the system, um, um, we can detect whether there, there's potentials um, like, like uh, this. So we have and the allocated, uh, we can detect um, um, this is kind of what the banker's algorithm does. Um, but it might potentially be a 29 some states and don't have enough resources um, available for A and B that um, the request comes for those um, in time that the massive deadlocks will develop in the system. That's not a complete explanation, but um, that's kind of what this. Um, determination of the safe state that we give an algorithm for um, in figure 6.9 of our textbook is doing here. And, um, and I'll show that in a, in a little bit here, but then actively what it's able to do is algorithmically detect a potential situation where um, further requests um, could create a deadlock in the system. Um, all right, but, it, but but even if you don't quite understand kind of how the, the how it's making the determination that the state is safe, um, I mean you can still do these um, um, by hand uh, pretty easily, so you can still follow the algorithm. So to understand these, I mean you have to understand the representation of the system. So to to represent the state 
of the system, we use this sort of matrix uh, notation. Um, so we keep two vectors and two matrices. Um, um, so a resource vector, um, so I mean, that's just the total number of resources of each process. Um, and I gave those to you, you know, I, I gave you um, all of these um, for the problem set. Um, although th there's a third vector that you need, uh, the need matrix, um, or at least that's useful for Performing the, the banker's algorithm. So, by the way, you've got your total number of resources um, and uh, you've got your total available. So, I talked about this on Tuesday, right? So, there's a relationship between all of these. Um, and then you've got your current allocations in A and your current um, uh, your, your maximum claims that you need. And so, this, this is one another thing that represents uh, extra overhead. And this is one reason why. Uh, it might not be um, practical to implement deadlock avoidance because processes don't always know uh, what their maximum number of resources they might need when they run. Okay. So, so this is kind of a limitation up front. Um, so to, to run uh, deadlock avoidance algorithms to, to avoid deadlocks, you have to make you have to enforce it that all processes when they start have to um, announce to the operating system when they're starting up what the maximum is, which resources they need, and what the maximum is of each resource they need, right? So with, without that claim matrix, you can't calculate the, the safe or unsafe um, distinction, right? So that's, that's a bit of a, and, but, but the, like I was saying, you know, that's, that can be um, unreasonable. So for, for real systems, when you build them, um, you know, so how many uh, resource A I need that might depend on my input data, you know, so, so um, if I'm running this loop, I might only need uh, one of the resource, but uh, if, I, if I run this loop, if I end up needing to run this loop 100 times, I might need it 100 of those or something like that. So, um, and then, um, you can you can easily keep track of what you currently have allocated, right? So so whatever I'm at, right? A is approximately allocated A, and now for B, I got one allocated one. So I mean, that, that's just a count of for each process the resources that they they've allocated. So um, and if it's hard to see in this diagram, um, basically the rows are the process. So. Um, so to all of row one are the claims for process one. Um, and all of row two are the claims for process two. So, so index I um, is being used to, to give the process number. Um, and kind of like I mentioned last time, our textbook uses, you know, starts at, at, at index one for the resource and index one for the process. So just be aware of that, you know, so you could start at the indexing at zero. Um, so resource root zero, resource one, and so on. Or we can start at index one, um, like we're doing here. Um, and uh, so and the, then the columns end up being the um, um, organized by resource, right? So column one is going to be the claims and the allocations for the resource one. Right, and that's our second index um, in this representation. Column two will be for resource two and so on. Um, so I mentioned, I mean, these are mathematical expressions, but these are just saying things like, um, for example, um, if you know what um, my current allocations are, so if I add up all my allocations for resource one, right, and I, if I know that I, so, so just to put concrete numbers on these, if, if I know that I've got 10 resource ones, um, and if I add up my allocations for all the processes uh, of, of resource, and I've got five allocated, um, that means that the available has to be five in that case. So, so the, the, the sum of my current allocations plus my available has to be equal to the total of that resource for each of the in resources I have in the system. Right? So that's, that's really all this is saying here. Mm -hmm. 
and um, and you know there are limitations. So if I claim that I need five of resource one, I can never allocate more than five of resource one. So the system, the the, the system that's doing deadlock avoidance has to enforce that, right? So, so if I come along and, and if I, I say that I, I need at most five of resource one, and I come along and try to allocate the sixth one, the process needs to be terminated. Um, so that's an illegal operation to try and get more than you claim to need. And likewise, it, when, when a process starts up, it's, it's nonsensical to cl claim that I'm ever gonna need more than I have resources available in the system. So if I have 10 of resource one, I can't run the process that claims it might need 11 or more of those. That, that's all these things you're saying here. Um, so yeah, technically, basically what the, the um, deadlock avoidance, the banker's algorithm is checking is this relationship here. Um, and so it's unsafe if, if a new request leads to um, um, the situation, or, um, where we might have to overcommit. So, so basically, what's happening here is, is we're checking whether we've potentially overcommitted any particular resource, right? So if the um, summation of the claims that processes need plus the, 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 the new claims that come in exceeds the resource. Uh, we're going to say that that's unsafe to grant that. So again, it comes down to the, these the, um, maximum claims um, that are really being checked uh, to determine whether it's safe or not. So, um, So I thought I would just kind of look through the example um, from our textbook here a little bit more, just to give you an idea. So what you had to do for the, the second or the third part of the problem set was I give you the state um, and you have to tell me whether it's safe or not, just that current state or that given state of the system. So that worked like this. So, you know, you, you can look at the, um, Algorithm, but we're going to run this by hand here. Um, with the, with the part C here is the algorithm to determine whether the state is safe or not using the banker's algorithm. Um, so, for example, so I, I think part two of the problem set, I asked you to, to calculate the need matrix. So, so the need matrix is just um, the, the difference between what you claim uh, is the maximum you need for a resource versus what you currently have allocated, right? C minus A is what I called in or the need in your third problem. Set, right? so, so again, um, um, in this system, um, process one claimed it needed three of resource one, it currently has one. So that means it need, that means that it potentially needs two more of resource one. Right? So this is different, gonna be the difference of those is, is your need matrix. Two minus zero is two, two minus zero is two, right? So this means that that the um, Given my current allocations, P1 potentially needs two more of resource one, two, and three. And, and, and the difference between this and this for process two is zero, zero, one. So, so given that I claim I need 613 and I currently have 612, P2 needs potentially just one more of resource three and so on. Um, So given that, um, so, so this is my claim, this is my allocation. Uh, and, and also, you know, you can double check. Uh, this is what the first thing I asked you to do on, on the problem set here. Um, so given that this is my, my total number of resources, so, so we can confirm or, or check, we, we can figure out what the available is of each resource from the current allocations and the total, right? So, you know, if I look down for resource one and my allocations, I've got 
uh, nine allocated of resource one between my three processes, right? And there's nine total of resource one, that means there's zero available, right? All, all nine of resource one is allocated. Um, and I've currently got two allocated of resource two, there's three total, so there's one available of resource two. I've got uh, five allocated of resource three, there's six total, so there's one still available of resource three. So all those relationships have to hold for this, this state of the system to be valid. So to determine if this state is safe or not, we run kind of a simulation. Um, so the, this is essentially gonna be checking that um, uh, we're not over committed um, on any of our maximum claims for the resources here. So, um, so for example, um, I'm going to go back down to the um, the algorithm here. So, so we start. We we mainly do this by using a loop, but we start by um, um, the, the way this algorithm states it is. Um, um, we make a copy of the currently available because we're going to be modifying this as we kind of simulate processes running to completion. So we'll call that uh, current available here. So, um, So, so this is just a copy of the beam. We'll go back and see in a second here. Um, so, so, so we start by just making a copy of available. Um, and we have to keep track of which processes we've marked already as being uh, kind of running to completion. So, um, so far, all we have Completely same process. So we have four processes. Um, in this example, we're doing some more textbook here. So, so yeah, four processes. Um, and then we're just going to keep doing this loop. So, in English, what we do is we need to try and find a process um, whose um, needs. So, so this is just the claim minus allocation. So, so here, this is um, um, really the needs. So find a process whose needs uh, can be met by the current available um, that we can have here, right? And if we find such a process, um, so if we find a process whose needs can be met, we, we're going to simulate, I, I think of it as simulate that, that, okay, we go ahead and give that process all the resources that it says it needs, so if a process has, has all the resources it needs, uh, potentially we can just let that process run and only that process run until it's done. And then when it's done, um, um, it would re release all of its currently allocated resources. So it would give its resources back to the system, right? But that's what we're really doing on these steps here, right? So if we find such a process whose needs to be met, um, um, we're gonna give it all of its resources that it asked for, let it run, and then it's then when it's running, when it's finished, it can return all of its allocated resources back to the available resources. Okay. And we, we mark it as being done. Okay. So we remove it from our list of processes um, that uh, haven't been run yet, um, that, that still need to be completed. That's what the rest is doing. And then we keep doing that until either um, all the processes are done. So that, that's why, um, um, so if we don't find a process um, that um, um, whose needs can be met, then, then we'll stop the loop there. Right? Or, or here, if there's no processes left, also we'll stop the loop here. So what's both happening here on the else case. So either no process can, can meet its needs with the current available or there's no processes left, everything's run, right? Um, and then at the end, basically the state is safe if all the processes were successfully run, right? But if, if, if uh, well, there have to be at least two processes. So if two or more processes 
didn't run, then the state wasn't safe. We, um, we had an overcommitment of, of our resources um, for the claims um, that were given. So, all right. So anyway, back, back to this. So for example, given the state, then uh, we can use that algorithm to determine whether it's safe or not, all right? So the first question is, so, so we've still got all four processes. Uh, so, so if any process leave, which is C minus A, and it being met um, by the current middle, right? So look, we, we usually look through them one by one. Process one needs two of resource one, and well, we've got zero. So process one is um, likewise, process three and four are candidates by step over two because they all need resource one as well. We don't have any so none of those work, but process two needs zero, zero, one. And that's zero, one. Process two only needs one more of resource three, and we have a resource three. So process two is a candidate. So what we would do is we would select process two to run, we would give it. It's resource three that it needs. Then we would simulate it. Um, so process two runs. Uh, we would simulate it running and returning its allocations back. Right. So once process two is done, it can return back its six one two resources back to the system so that others can use those. So if we add six one two to that now, that's current available. And then you continue on. Okay, so, so the loop continues on. So, so now we move process two because it ran. So now again we ask the day. On the processes, let's go have the rest of the processes that they have to run in addition to that. Any of those need to be met through the process. Right? So at this point, I think all the processes can run, right? So process one needs to do two. Um, and we've got Enough of all those process ones again. Once we get to a point where all the main processes can run, you know the system. So, let's just go. So, so I found right away I found uh, candidate process one looks like it can run because it needs to be two. So the best lesson are equal to all these. Uh, so I give it this two to two, let it run. That I return back its allocation. The process one only had one of resource one. Seven, two, three. One, ask again. So process three needs one, zero, three. One, zero, three can be met. Three, return its resources back. Two, one, one now. So once you get down to one, also you know that um, before, of course, your zero is all less. Back to two. We did this all the way to completion. If every process is run, it's released all its resources. So we should end up with the original resource vector R because everything is re released back. So everything's back to being available. Another double check you can do. Um, all right, so that state is safe by this um, algorithm. Right? So if you ever do that and you get to a point where you still have processes, but none of them, um, none of them needs to be met from what's currently available, then the state, then the yeah, the state, the, the original state is unsafe. So I think that's what the second example from our textbook does. Um, um, so let's say that P1 requests one each of, of R1 and R3. Okay, this is what you do for the last part of problem three. So this is what normally happens for the banker's algorithm. So if I 
I have a new request from P1 asking for uh, these. Are, these are normally stated in terms of an additional request. Okay, there was a common mistake people make on this part of the problem. So we need to add these onto what it currently is out. So, so we're not saying that P1 ends up with um, like one of one and one of three. We're saying we're add. We're getting an additional one. Of one, one. So what that ends up, so you end up with this state here, if I remember right. Um, or this this was our initial state. This is the same as we were using before. Um, so so uh, yeah, initially the system looks like this. So after allocating P1 request initial one of resource one and then initial one of resource three, this is the new proposed. So now what we have to ask then is, so, so once we change that, um, that also uh, reduces our needs, right? So, so uh, the needs go down by one uh, for resource one and resource three, and we've allocated an additional um, version of one and three. So I guess the state was a little bit different from what we had before. Oh, uh, yeah, so from this example from the textbook, um, um, what we end up now is uh, the same state that we just did before. Okay, so, so, so now um, this is the state. So this is the state before we had the request that came in. So now our state looks like this, and this was actually the state that I just worked worked through. So we already proved that the state was safe. Okay, so what that means by the backwards algorithm is that uh, we should go ahead and grant that request because it leads to this new state, um, and we just work through. We just showed that that state was safe. So, um, so uh, no, this was supposed to be an unsafe. Um, so let's let's work through this here. So um, that was different because the available right there and the P two right there. Uh, see that the one you first worked through was like. Zero, zero, one. Right. No, no, we didn't. Right. So, um, but yeah, I was thinking that the, that the, the part B here, we ended up with the same state. But yeah, we checked that. Um, is that different? Um, yeah, so these, these states are different here. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I'm saying that a little bit wrong. So let's, let's go ahead and work through. So this, this is supposed to be an example of an unsafe state. So, um, so let's just correct that. So, so yeah, the state is a little bit different. So, so if we work through this, we should find that it's unsafe, I guess. Yeah. So, um, so let's just take what they have there. Um, and try. So, so this is the state that we're going to test. See what whether it's safe or unsafe. Um, so we start off with our Bs of 0, 1, 1 again. Um, and all processes haven't been done. Um, our needs should be up to date. So, um, well, yeah. So, I mean, immediately it's, it's obvious that the state is unsafe here um, because um, immediately we, we have no candidate for the very first time through the loop here. So, this is a, a simple example uh, of an unsafe, at least. Running the um, bankers algorithm by hand, right? Because uh, basically, we need everybody needs at least one of resource one, but we end up with none of them available um, here. So there was no candidate, so the loop fails. Um, and well, again, we come out of the loop, uh, and there's still two or more processes that haven't been run. Um, the 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 conclusion is is that the state is not safe. Yeah, so that is that is actually an unsafe state right there. So, uh, it is it is possible to um, have an example. I don't have one handy um, uh, offhand, but it is possible that um, you know it's not immediately obvious that the state is unsafe. So it is it is possible to have a request um, and you can run you know two or three processes, um, but. You still get to a point where um, some processes can't be run, um, uh, even though a few could be um, selected and, and run to completion.
Um, all right, so that, um, yeah, one more thing I kind of want to jump to, but, but yeah, that's, hopefully that should help people um, problem set questions on, yeah. Um, yeah, I would recommend, especially for uh, the, the, the last one that you show me the new state after, um, um, you know, after adding in the, the new requested thing, right? So, so that, yeah, I mean, right. But so before you determine whether it, it's um, um, safe or not, I mean, you ought to show me, I mean, um, claim wouldn't change. But, uh, but yeah, once you add some new allocations, the allocations will change, the needs will change, and the available will change. So you definitely probably want to show me the, 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 those three, the, the, the new ones that change. Yeah, I mean, your total resources and your claims should always be the same. Right? And the other thing, I mean, kind of like what I showed there, it would, it would be best um, to prove that it's safe to actually show, okay, process one ran, and then current available became this, and then process three ran, and so on. Right? So that's, that's a sufficient in, um, demonstration that the state was safe. You can show the sequence of processes and uh, their returning um, back to current. Um, so I probably didn't leave myself quite enough time, um, but I did want to maybe jump and say one or two things about um, uh, some stuff from chapter five here, um, just real quickly. Um, like I said, I had, had, had this in the video, so there's another video about um, uh, this, but um, I would... So, um, just wanted to return this real quickly because chapter five was about um, building mechanisms um, in the hardware and the software. Um, See. Um, um, so in particular, um, we talked about some mechanisms for enforcing mutual exclusion. Um, so uh, semaphores, uh, monitors, uh, spin locks, and things like that. So, but, but mostly sem semaphores um, is kind of the main one that we spent a lot of time with on chapter five. Um, so I thought I'd come back real quickly and, and um, kind of mention this. So remember from our problem set two, um, we had this example using threads where we had two threads accessing a global variable called my global. Um, and, and we showed that there was interference. So, so, so this is technically a type of a race condition um, because of the order that they access uh, and modify the my global variable, um, you don't get the full sum, um, like we're kind of expecting here, or we're kind of illustrating, right? So um, um, this was the original one. So if you do, um, you do it where the, 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 the first thread uh, actually used three statements to uh, read the global variable, increment it by one, and then write back out and do that kind of after sleeping for a second. Um, and then the other thread, actually in main, but the, the other loop um, did a similar thing, but did it all just in one operation and all before sleeping, right? So that's just to remind you. But the, the problem was is that um, um, because of the way this is set up, especially because this one goes to sleep, um, it's highly likely that we switch over and, and do the other thread. Uh, but at that point, we've only read my global value into a local variable j and incremented it, uh, but uh, we haven't actually uh, saved our result back out to the shared memory. So if the other thread runs at this point, which is highly likely from the setup, it will 
actually read the value out and um, um, increment it and, and, and save its result. Um, but then when we come back to this thread, um, um, or, or well, when we jumped into that other one, it was reading out the value that hadn't been incremented yet. So the result is we, we end up losing um, some work here. Um, so you know, even though both loops are running 25 times and supposedly are trying to increment the, the value by one, we don't end up with 50. Um, uh, we consistently end up with quite a bit less than that, so 26 usually. Right. So, um, so our chapter five talks about mechanisms. So, um, in chapter five, um, in order to implement mutual exclusion mechanisms that are useful at the at the software level, so for the operating system, there has to be some hardware support. So, there are actually machine instructions. Um, um, for um, that are provided by modern uh, CPUs that are meant to be used by operating system to create uh, these mechanisms like a semaphore, right? Um, so, but we, we normally don't use those directly because uh, they have some drawbacks. So, um, and, and, and you know, we talk, I talk about those on the lecture videos. So um, normally if, if you're writing a concurrent program like, like a threaded application um, and you need to enforce some mutual exclusion you will use a, a mechanism that the operating system provides like like a, a semaphore or something else like that so in in linux uh in unix um there's a there's a system semaphore um, you can just include it um, and um, it works something like this so um, it actually is, is, is really just provides some uh, functions that you can call and it provides a data structure. Um, so in this case, the, 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 the type of the data structure is semaphore underscore key, semaphore type. And I just called that lock here. Um, it's hard to see, but for me. Um, Um, right. So to use the this semaphore from the semaphore library from Unix, um, you, you create an instance of the semaphore, we call it lock here, and then you have functions you can call on it. So basically, if you once you've read the chapter five, if you haven't done it already, uh, there's two things you can normally do with the semaphore. You can call wait on the semaphore, um, and uh, our textbook calls it what? Um, I forget, but um, 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 wait and uh, basically lock and unlock. So you can wait on the semaphore um, and um, 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 send a message um, uh, to you know, unlock the semaphore. I, I usually think of these as so, so the wait as just locking the semaphore. So when you call wait, you're, you're basically going to be obtaining uh, the, the lock on the semaphore and post um, um, in this. Linux implementation of the semaphore does the unlock, basically, right? So um, to make this code safe uh, for concurrency, if I just lock, so, so, so both, both of my threads can use the same semaphore. In each thread before it accesses and increments, my global needs to lock it and then needs to unlock it after um, it does its work and is done manipulating the, the global shared resource. Right? So, so we do that in the original thread function and we do that um, in our, um, for some reason in the code uh, that, I, that I did this, I, I broke it off into two separate functions here. So we call it um, a thread function zero and thread function one, but we're still doing the same thing like we did before. So. Um, so yeah, thread function one is what we were doing before in the main thread um, where we incremented as a single. Um, here, since I'm only accessing my global variable on that one line of code, I could potentially actually move my unlock to right after that, right? So the, the critical section um, is defined by the, 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 the lock and then the unlock of the semaphore. 
right? So we, we talk about critical sections in chapter five here, but the critical section only has to enclose the manipulation of that shared variable that you're trying to protect, right? Um, so um, I could have reduced my critical section here a little bit by moving this up. Here. Um, but anyway, if you do that um, and recompile the code um, in this version called PS32 Semaphore, run it. And you'll see it actually does fix the problem, although, um, let's see, that, but. Um, 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 I have an issue though. So what you'll see is it's all running O's first. It's running 25 um, times on, on this one, on the thread function one. Um, so it does all of those for some reason. And then it goes over and uh, it does all the ones from thread function zero here. So I'll, I'll scroll that up once it gets done here so you can see it better. Um, But um, you will get the correct results, um, although it's not doing really in, in or even interleave. So you do get 50 there. Okay. Um, so the issue here is that the, the, the basic semaphore uh, in, in Linus is not a. Um, 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 it's not a strong semaphore. So our, our chapter five talks about strong versus weak. So basically it's not enforcing fairness. Uh, uh, it's not enforcing the access order on the semaphore. So um, 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 when you when you try and get a lock, if the lock isn't available, you're gonna be blocked, right? So for a strong semaphore, which is a fair semaphore, um, it will have some sort of a queue, queuing mechanism so that it keeps track of who tried to get the lock first that end up being blocked and then who was second, third, fourth. So, so it keeps in, 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 in order. And then once the lock becomes unlocked, um, it will take the one who's been waiting the longest. So that's, that's a fair or a strong semaphore, right? Uh, the, the, the basic semaphore here for, for Linux doesn't do that. So what happens is, um, so, so we see all of the, uh, the, the, the the O's happen first because basically um, you, you can get it so that I think that the other one happens first. Uh, well, um, yeah, because they're both they're both sleeping inside of, of their lock here. Um, so so they both end up blocking, um, but um, um, the O runs first. So when it runs it, uh, it'll get the lock. Um, and the other one will be um, blocked waiting on the lock. Um, and it will run and I'll put the O and that will unlock it. But when it unlocks it, it, it immediately jumps back up and tries to get the lock again, right? So at that point, they're, they're both waiting on the lock. Um, um, they're both blocked on that. Uh, but um, um, Basically, whichever whichever process the, the CPU runs next, uh, whichever thread the, C, the, the sorry whichever thread the operating system runs next is the one that's going to end up uh, obtaining the lock here. So what happens is that uh, since it unlocks and it immediately tries to lock it again, the other process um, 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 most likely the, the operating system just keeps running this process. So it unlocks, comes back and, and it locks it immediately. So, and, then, and then when it gets here to the sleep, um, the, the, the pro this thread will be blocked on the sleep, but the, pro the problem is, is that it still has the lock. Okay, or one of the problems is, you know, it still has a lock. So, so even if, if we switch back over to the other thread and try to run it, um, uh, it's gonna find that the, the, the the semaphore is locked, so it's not going to get it still, right? Um, so yeah, the, the result is is we get that uh, since the the, the semaphore isn't um, fundamentally a fair semaphore. It's not enforcing um, ordering here. So. 
So um, um, there's another example of, of a strong semaphore, although, um, I mean, if, if you're interested, you can look at the code. These are all in the example code in our um, course repository here. Um, as far as I could find, there's no um, direct implementation of like a, a fair semaphore like this, like, like is described in our textbook on Linux, our units, um, but we can fix it. Uh, this code here, we actually um, add our own functions to wrap around the, uh, the unfair, um, the, the weak semaphore uh, in order to add a queue into it. So we can put things onto a queue and pull them off um, by their um, by how long they were waiting on the queue. So, um, so otherwise, though, this does exactly the same thing. So we've got like our um, signal is is um, the uh, sim sim wait sim signal is what our textbook calls those. So, so wait basically does a lock and a signal does not unlock um, on a semaphore. So. Um, but, uh, but yeah, besides implementing our own uh, strong semaphore, um, uh, this code does exactly the same thing though. So we've got the thread function zero um, that does it as three steps and the thread function one that does it as a single step, but they both, but they, they call, now we call the, uh, the strong semaphore to lock it before and then Call the signal afterwards to unlock it. Um, but the difference on this one, if you can see it, is um, that um, because it's a strong semaphore, it is going to enforce um, ordering. Um, so it'll pull them off by the queue. So, so even though, um, again, the, 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 this one ran first, because we got the O came out first. So it's like got the lock, incremented, and it unlocked. But then when it goes back up and calls sim wait um, for the strong semaphore, um, um, the other process. Already also blocked, so it, it was ahead of this one on, on the queue. Uh, so, so a side effect of, of a strong semaphore like this is that we'll also enforce um, the interleave here. Right? So, so the fairness means that um, uh, we'll always end up switching between that back and forth. All right, um, you know that, that that's just kind of side, but but uh, but you know that's um, an actual example of some of the stuff that was talked about in chapter five, um, and and that's you know really how these um, mutual exclusion mechanisms are normally used. So so however it's implemented, I mean normally you're you're using them um, in, in a similar way like this. So you have to define a critical section around uh, the shared resource that you need to protect and, and, you, and you just lock and unlock um, the lock on make access to that, um, that shared resource, right? Whatever you call the lock and the unlock. So. Um, all right, so yeah, that, that was all I kind of wanted to talk about. So uh, we'll go ahead and end the session there. So unless you guys have some further questions on things, problem set. But uh, otherwise, that's it. See you guys later then. Yep. Share to action. Nobody joined now, so. <laughs>